Welcome to week 11 of our series called God versus Satan, the first 4,000 years. Last time we left off uh, with Jesus Christ having to now carry the cross up the hill to Calvary. And so we're going to pick up the true narrative there. And I need, again, you to throw yourself into this, into this narrative. Imagine what this was like for Jesus. All the torture and the beatings he's gone through, uh, not eaten in 24 hours, had nothing to drink, I'm sure. They didn't care about him uh, as far as his physical needs. And now he is going to have to carry this cross. And it's step after agonizing step. The human side of him had reached its physical end. He had been through too much and he falls face first into the gravel. If you were him, would you keep going? And what did keep him going? It is my guess that what kept him going was you. Him seeing your faces is what kept him going. Your precious faces. He loves you so very much. He knew that you and I were headed for a Christless eternity. Unless he paid that awful, terrible price. Only then could you and I be declared righteous before God. He couldn't bear the thought of eternity without you. He knew that you and I didn't have a chance of getting into heaven. And if he didn't get back up time after time after time, you and I would be lost for all eternity. I want you to really think about this. If you have ever felt unloved, if there has been a time in your life or multiple times in your life where you have not felt loved, all you got to do is go back to this time in history when Jesus Christ physically was taking bloody step after bloody step and he would fall face down into the gravel and the dirt and he would spit out the dirt and the gravel and he would muster up the strength to get back up one more time and keep going to go where? To the agony of the cross. And so again, if you have ever felt unloved, Jesus Christ loved you so much that he went through this for you and for me. Hundreds of years before this account, there was a prophecy written in the Psalms that said this, <clears throat> For dogs have encompassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. See, earlier in his ministry, Christ had said this. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus does this willingly. Jesus does this by his own choice. I love this image because it just represents, it's very symbolic that Jesus willingly gave up his life. As the God-man, there was no way they could take his life from him unless he willingly gave it up. Two sinners were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left, to fulfill the prophecy in Isaiah which says, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Scripture goes on and says they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. He was so thirsty. He literally says, I thirst. And when they bring him this wine mixed with gall, he tastes it and then refuses to drink it. Why? It's because gall was a drug, and that drug would have, in, in, in many ways, lessened the pain for him. And Jesus Christ needed to feel the entire pain of what the crucifixion was all about. And so he refused to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. 
He had been stripped naked when he was crucified. How humiliating. Hundreds, if not thousands of people would have turned out to watch the spectacle, including his own mom. I want you to think about this. We never see images of Jesus Christ on the cross naked for good reason. We always have, he always has that loincloth on, but that's not what they did. The crucifixion was all about pain and humiliation and, and making a, uh, uh, teaching this person a lesson and all the people watching, teaching them a lesson that you don't go against Rome. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was stripped naked in humiliation for all to see, including his own mom. And then they began to berate him and to mock him. Save yourself and come down from the cross. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let the king come down from the cross, and then we will believe. Can you just imagine what this was like for Jesus? Puny mortals mocking the God of the universe. The ironic thing is this. He could have come down from the cross. At any moment, he could have come down from the cross. But the irony is, if he had done that, then the very people who are mocking him would have had no chance to be saved. You and I would have no chance to be saved. Could he come down from the cross? Absolutely. But he chose not to so that he could save us. I'm just going to be honest. I would have looked down from that cross after all what I had gone through and all the mocking they were doing, and I would have killed them all. I would have looked at them, and with a thought, I would have stopped their hearts. Every last one of them. All the pain, the mocking, the evil, but not Jesus. Jesus, who is so full of grace and mercy, instead, he prays for them, and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here is how a medical doctor explained the crucifixion. He says it was the most agonizing death that a man could face. He had to support himself in order to breathe. The flaming pain caused by the spikes hitting the median nerve in the wrist explodes up his arm into his brain and down his spine. As you look at this image, you'll see that the nail is through his wrist. A lot of images that we will see will show the nail coming right here through the hand. And we know from uh, Roman crucifixion that they never did that. If you put the nail through here and your weight was being supported by those two places, the hands would have ripped off of the cross. Instead, they found a place right between the two bones right where the, the tibia or the, the radius and the ulna come together, there's a little notch there and that's where they put the nail through. But they also did it there not only to keep him on the cross, but that's where the median nerve is and that's where the most intense pain could be given to somebody who was being crucified. The spike burning through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet jerks his body erect. Then the leg muscles convulse and they drive his body downward, beating him against the cross. Every breath was agony. So much strain on your chest that you can't take a breath. And then you would push up on your feet to take a breath. And usually you would die of suffocation. Think about that. Think about that. The pain is causing him to spasm and just to slam his head back and forth against the cross. And every breath is agonizing torture. You are on that cross. And all that pain and all that, that pressure is on your diaphragm and you literally cannot take a breath unless you push up on the nail from your feet to take some of that pressure off and then you take a breath. <sighs> and then you hold it as long as you can. And before long, the, the pain is so much in your feet that you then have to move the pain to your hands into your wrists, and then the carbon dioxide starts to build up in your body. And every breath you push up, pain, breathe, <sighs> hold it as long as you can, more pain. Every second, 
every minute leading into hour after hour. The air is sucked in, but cannot be exhaled until that buildup of the CO2 in the lungs and the bloodstream stimulate breathing to relieve those cramps. Isn't it ironic that the tools of torture to kill Jesus, the carpenter, is a hammer, some nails, and some wood? Exhaustion, shock, dehydration, and paralysis begin to destroy his body. His heart is barely able to pump the thick blood because of his dehydration. As each of his billions of cells die one at a time. Our sins sent Jesus Christ to the cross. Your sins and my sins did this to Jesus Christ. There's this controversy when, when the Passion of the Christ movie came out. There was all this controversy over, oh, they're, they're showing that the Jewish people killed, killed Jesus. No, it was the Roman soldiers who killed Jesus. I'm here to tell you that the Bible is very clear. You killed Jesus. I killed Jesus with my sins. The Bible describes his physical appearance at this point, and it's not a pretty picture. Isaiah 52, 14 says, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Not only did he not look like Jesus anymore, he did not look human anymore. That's how badly disfigured he was. He was horrible to look upon. The Bible says that his mother was there through the whole thing. Imagine what's going through her mind at this moment. Scripture says near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Beloved, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Think about this. All this torture that Jesus is going through, and he looks down and he's caring for his mom still. And he looks at John, the disciple who he was closest to, and he literally is saying this to John. John, please take care of my mom. Jesus knows he's going to die. He's going to be dead for a while, and then he's going to rise from the grave. And he's going to spend 40 days on earth and then he is going to go back up into heaven and he charges John with taking care of his mom. This was the turning point of all history. Never was there a day like this day. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross that terrible day was not human blood. It was the precious blood of God. It was God's blood. The most precious substance in all the universe is the blood of Jesus Christ. Without that shed blood, we would be dead and lost in our sins. It was the only thing that could wash away our sins. Why did Jesus go through all of this for us? Because he loved you. Because he loved me. Scripture goes on and says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The Bible says that the sky became black. In fact, it became pitch black from noon until 3 p.m. Out of nowhere this happens. Imagine how crazy and freaky this would be to be there at where it's supposed to be the brightest part of the day 
And all of a sudden it becomes so dark you can't see your hand in front of your face. Satan is relishing this moment. The moment when he thinks his enemy is going to be defeated once and for all. The moment that he thinks God's plan has come to a screeching halt. But it was at this moment that Jesus was dreading most of all. Because this was the moment that God placed every single sin that's ever been committed inside of Jesus and upon Jesus. The eclipse of the sun signifies the horrible darkness of sin that is being placed on his son at this moment. And Jesus screams out these words. Eloi! Eloi! Lama sakbachthani! Which literally means, Abba, Father, why have you forsaken me? Father, why have you abandoned me? This cry of Jesus is a fulfillment of Psalm 22.1. It's one of the many parallels between that psalm and the specific events of the crucifixion. It is difficult to understand in what sense Jesus was forsaken by God. It is certain that God approved of his work. It is certain that Jesus was innocent. He had done nothing to forfeit the favor of God. And as God's own son, he was holy, harmless, undefiled, and obedient. And God still loved him. In none of these senses could God have forsaken him. In Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, it says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus redeemed us from this curse and he was made a curse for us. He was made a sin offering and then he died in our place on our account that he might bring us near to God. It was this, doubtless, that intensified his sufferings and part of why Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was this manifestation of God's hatred of sin in some unexplained way that Jesus experienced in that terrible hour. The suffering he endured was due to us. We were supposed to pay that price. And it was that suffering by which we can be saved from eternal life. In those awful moments, as evil men were allowed to do whatever they wanted to Jesus, our Lord expressed his feelings of abandonment. God placed the sins of the world on his son, and Jesus, for a time, felt the desolation of being unconscious of his Father's presence. How horrible that would have been for him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, It was at this time that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is no other possible reason for Jesus to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It could be that Jesus' intent in quoting Psalm 22, 1 was to point his hearers to the psalm. And when they read Psalm 22, they would no doubt see the many fulfilled prophecies included in that song of David. Even while experiencing the agony of the cross, Jesus was teaching the crowds and proving yet again that he was the Messiah who fulfilled all of these scriptures. Here's the best way that I can describe this. What does it feel like for that holy God to have the sin placed on him? Precious and innocence now having sin placed inside of him. This is going to sound gross, but I can't think of a better way to describe it. It would be like you and I going out into our backyard. And we have two St. Bernards and two German Shepherds. And that backyard is filled with dog manure. It would be like us going up and grabbing handfuls of the dog manure 
and taking that and wiping it all over our bodies and putting it up our nose and putting it inside of our ears and even in our mouth. And I know you're thinking to yourself, that is so stinking gross. That's what it would have felt like times a billion for the pure and innocent, holy son of God to even have one sin placed upon him. But God took the sins of the world and placed it upon him. And at that moment, when God looked at that sin that was placed on Jesus, and God hates sin, that Jesus felt abandoned. When my son Connor was about three years old, and Caleb was about six years old, they were outside playing in the backyard. And Connor picked up a stick from the backyard, and Caleb happened to have the pruning shears in his hands. And Connor, that little three-year-old, walked up to Caleb and said, Hey, Caleb, cut the stick. And Caleb went to cut that stick. But instead of cutting the stick, Caleb cut into to Connor's precious three-year-old hand and fingers. And I was in the kitchen at the time, and I heard a blood-curdling scream come from our backyard. And I run to the door, and I run out in the backyard, and I see my precious son holding his hand and blood is squirting out. And he is screaming, Daddy! Daddy! And I run up to him and he says to me, screaming, Daddy, I need a Band-Aid! And as funny as that sounds now, that cut to my heart. In his little three-year-old mind, he thought of two things. He was in so much pain and he is seeing blood come out of him. And he thinks to himself, if I can just get to my dad, everything's going to be okay. And if I can just get a Band-Aid on this, it's going to take care of this problem. How it would have felt for Jesus Christ, and I know this illustration falls way short of this, this is the best I can think of. It would be like as if I went out into that backyard and I looked at my precious three-year-old as he is screaming for help from his dad. And I looked at him, and I said no. And I turn back, and I go into the house, and I lock the door. That's what it would have felt like for Jesus Christ to have the full fury and wrath of God against sin placed on him and poured into him. I think the worst part for Jesus was not the physical pain of all of this. The worst part for Jesus Christ was the spiritual pain of having the wrath of God poured out on him. The wrath of God that we should experience for all eternity was poured on Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the sin of us all. Jesus faces the full fury of God's wrath at this moment. Eternities of punishment in hell is condensed down to this moment in time as God pours out his wrath on his son. See, God is outside of time. I remember once I had a teenager who was meeting with, with Christy and I and she said these words to me. She said, you tell me that Jesus Christ can relate to what I am going through. And she said, I cannot believe that. She said, because I know Jesus Christ never sinned. And she said, I am a sinner all the way through my body. And she said, most of all, I am a drug addict. And, and you're telling me that Jesus knows how I feel as a drug addict when he never took any drugs? She said, I just cannot believe that. And this is what I told her. At this moment on the cross, Jesus had the sin of addiction. Jesus had the sin of abuse placed on him. Jesus had the sin of rape placed on him. Jesus had the sin of murder, of pride, of greed. Every horrible thing that people have done from the time of Adam and Eve till the time where the last person will live on the face of this earth somewhere in earth's history. And Jesus, because he is outside of time, felt each one of those in real time, just like we feel it. 
Just like God can have a billion people praying to him at any given moment, he can sort out all of those prayers and hear them as if that person is the only person that is praying to him. Jesus Christ knows everything that you are experiencing and feeling, and he can relate to that. I came across this video. This is a powerful video that shows what Jesus Christ went through at this moment. Let's watch this. a powerful video to show what Jesus Christ went through at that time. Scripture says that his last words were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he said the three most significant words in history. It is finished. Meaning that the job that God had given him was accomplished. Our sin had been paid for in full by his blood. The final sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. No more animal sacrifices to try and cover up sins. No, the blood of Jesus Christ removes sins. Scripture says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Another gospel writes it this way. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last and then he gave up his spirit. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw that he had died with such a cry, said, surely this man was the son of God. This Roman centurion had watched this whole spectacle take place and he was overcome by his sin and he repented and he put his faith in Jesus Christ right there at the foot of the cross. See, there was apparently no evidence that death was near when his life was suddenly and unexpectedly terminated. You see, crucifixion always caused a long, slow, and lingering death in which the victim grew weaker and weaker until he became unconscious. Even with all the torture, there is no way that Jesus should have died so soon. Did you know that they usually hung on the cross for three or four days when somebody was crucified? 
It was an almost unheard of thing for a crucified person to die within two or three days unless death was hastened by other means. Jesus did not die as the result of the crucifixion itself. In the second place, Jesus died very suddenly in the midst of terrible agony of mind and spirit. See, when that sin was placed on him and in him, and God poured his wrath on his son, I believe that his heart exploded in his chest. I firmly believe that Jesus, his heart just ruptured right in his chest at this moment. I believe that he literally died of a broken or ruptured heart. Why? Number one, because there is a prophecy in Psalms that describes this. Psalm 40, verse 12 says, For evils beyond number have surrounded me. Iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has failed me. Scripture says, Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead and they did not break his legs. Why? Why would they break the legs of people on the cross? The reason it took so long to die from crucifixion is that you slowly suffocated. And they needed their legs to push off for every breath as we talked about before. And so, in order to hurry up that death, they came by and they would just shatter the legs of the person. Isn't this interesting? A Sabbath was coming and they didn't want the, those bodies hanging on the cross during a Sabbath. And so they go to do this. While they're murdering the Son of God, they're still trying to make it look like they're following God. In fact, Pilate was shocked that he was already dead. Scripture says when Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for the privilege of burying Jesus, we are told that Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling unto him a centurion, he asked whether he had been any while dead. And so instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. John 19, 34, 35, and 36 says, These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one that they have pierced. I believe the most convincing evidence of all that Jesus died of a heart rupture was the flow of blood and water from the wound made in his side by the thrust of the spear. This only happens if your heart ruptures. Blood from the rupture had filled the pericardium, the sac around the heart, and blood naturally separates into red uh, blood cells and serum as it sits. I want to introduce you to a big word. In Scripture, Romans 3, 23 through 26 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has his faith in Jesus. That word propitiation refers to a sacrifice that appeases God's wrath by satisfying his justice. To propitiate in scripture is to placate and appease the wrath of God on behalf of a guilty sinner who deserves to be punished and in terms of the gospel is to turn such wrath into divine favor. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But let me share what tears me up the most about all of this. Do you know why Jesus Christ screamed out those words, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So that you and I would not have to sit in a place called hell someday and scream out those very words. 
so that we wouldn't have to be burning in hell screaming, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me to this place? And we would be saying that with the sickening knowledge that we deserve this eternal punishment because we made the choice to reject the free gift that God gave us through his son, Jesus Christ. That we told God our whole lives, God, I want nothing to do with you. And then God honored that decision in eternity. The thought of that makes me shudder. And it's why this is so serious. Other amazing things happened the moment that Jesus died. Scripture says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Only God could have carried out such an incredible feat because the veil was too high for human hands to have reached it and it was too thick to have torn it. That curtain, that veil was 60 feet in height, 30 feet in width, and four inches thick. Furthermore, it was torn from the top down, meaning this act must have come from God above. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus said that the veil was not only four inches thick, but that horses tied to each side could not pull the veil apart. As the veil was torn, the Holy of Holies was exposed. God's presence was now accessible to all. Shocking as this may have been to the priests who were ministering in the temple that day, it is indeed good news to us as believers because we know that Jesus' death has atoned for our sins and made us right before God. The torn veil illustrated Jesus' body, which was torn and broken for us, now opening the way for us to come to God. As Jesus cried out, it is finished on the cross, he was indeed proclaiming that God's redemptive plan was now complete. The age of animal offerings was over. The old covenant was done. The ultimate offering had been sacrificed and now a new covenant had arrived. We can now boldly enter into God's presence. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 says, The inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Another interesting thing is that the veil was rent. It was torn at the very hour of the evening sacrifice. At the very hour that the Passover lambs were being slain, Jesus cries out, it is finished. And while they are sacrificing a lamb in the temple, they hear this incredibly loud ripping and tearing as the veil was torn from top to bottom. As it says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. See, now there is an interesting connection between the tree of life and the temple veil. Let's go back 4,000 years from this time that the veil is torn. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Man committed sin against God and God determined that man must be barred from Eden, this place where God dwells and this place where God had planted the tree of life that source of life that will never end. When Adam and Eve sinned, God prevented them from accessing the tree of life. Genesis 3:24. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. These cherubim were fierce, angelic warriors and their ferocious swords now stood between God and man to serve as a warning and an object lesson. The object lesson is this, that the way is shut. Man can no longer be where God is. He can no longer walk and talk with God. He can no longer be near that source of life. Instead, he must live out his days alone to die and return to the dust which he was taken from. Where else does scripture speak of the tree of life? We find that in the book of Revelation. Revelation 22 1 through 4 says, Then he showed me the river of living water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the broad seat, street of the city. On both sides of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. 
The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. How do you wash your robes like this? Revelation 7, 14 says, I said to him, sir, you know. Then he told me these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. We have now come full circle since the curse. Some other interesting things happened at the time that Jesus died. Scripture says that when he died, the earth shook. There was an earthquake. The rocks split open and tombs broke open. And that the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Can you imagine all of this? This craziness that goes on? There's total darkness for three hours, followed by Jesus screaming his last words, followed by an earthquake which tears the veil in two and shakes the ground, followed by a bunch of dead people rising from the dead and going out and visiting many people in the city. Craziness, but awesome. Scripture also says, many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph the mother of Zebedee's sons. And I ask you, where were the men? John is the only one mentioned here. The only man mentioned of all of the disciples and the followers of Jesus Christ. Where were the men? They were in hiding. They weren't doing what God had called them to do. And it reminds me so much of what is going on in our churches today. Women are stepping up and serving God and the men are sitting on our butts, not being the spiritual leaders that God has called us to do. There would be a radical change in our churches if men stood up and started doing what God had called them to do and to do ministry and to lead their families and to start sharing the gospel, not only with their families, but with their friends and their coworkers and with the world. The world would radically change. If you're one of those guys listening to this, and you're not living for Jesus Christ, why? Why? If you're one of those guys who, have, who you know you've repented of your sins, and you know that Jesus Christ forgive them, how dare you and I sit on our butts and not do anything? In fact, may I say so boldly that if you say that you're a follower of Christ and there is no fruit in your life, if you say that you, you have repented of your sins, if you say that you know you're going to heaven and your life doesn't show that, can I just boldly look you right in the eye and say, you are not saved. Because if you were saved, if you came face to face with how horrible your sin was, you would fall flat on your face before God. And you would repent of your sins. And when you got up to your feet, you would say, you have forgiven me of my sins and I don't have to spend eternity in hell. Dear God, what can I do for you? How can I live my life for you in such a way to bring you honor and to bring you glory and to show you how thankful I am for what you have done for me? If your life doesn't look any different than the rest of the people in your life who don't name the name of Christ, then you're not a believer. And may today be the day that you get serious about your faith. And then we come to the burial of Jesus. Scripture says later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. And with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. And Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen, and this was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. 
And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Guess where all those men were? They were hiding. They couldn't believe that Jesus was gone and dead. They still didn't understand that Jesus said he had to do this, even though Jesus told them many times of what was going to happen. Satan has won. He now has control of the world. The promised Redeemer is dead. Or so Satan thinks. Spiritually, these were the darkest days in the history of the universe. It seemed like all hope was lost, and Satan and his demons were celebrating big time because it seemed like Satan had won. But this is Friday. <sighs> and Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we repent. We repent of how we live our lives. We live our lives as if your blood meant nothing. We live our lives as if your horrible sacrifice means nothing to us. And so this day, we repent. We repent of our horrible sin of taking this lightly. Lord, may you forgive us of this. May you give us spiritual power through the Holy Spirit to get up off of the ground in our repentance and start to walk in the light and start to be strong in our faith and start to use the spiritual power that you have given us through your Holy Spirit. And may we radically make a difference in our lives, in our families' lives, and in the lives of all of those we come, uh, come around. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen.